Welcome to Deakin University and to the Western Beach Room. My name's David Lowe. I'm head of the Contemporary Histories uh, Group at Deakin University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today. At this point, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wadarong people, and pay respect to them, their elders past and present, for their custodianship of the land. We're really lucky today to um, be having the second in a series of forums, talks, um, which mark the centenary of the First World War and Australia's involvement therein, and it's courtesy of an centennial grant, an Anzac Centennial Government grant, and we're very grateful to Commonwealth Government and to Richard Miles, local MP, for that support in facilitating such events. Today's theme is on Geelong women and the First World War, and we're fortunate to have a, a double header of an event, um, two extremely good and um, extremely well-rewarded historians in terms of the attention that their works have uh, received too, to talk to us. The format today is um, that we'll hear uh, Janet Butler first, and uh, we'll pause and invite you to um, have some discussion and ask questions of Janet, who will be talking about her book, which is up there on the screen. And we'll have a, a short tea break and then resume to hear from Ruth Lee talking about her book. So by way of introduction, um, Dr Janet Butler is an honorary associate in the history program at La Trobe University. Her PhD research on the wartime experiences of Sister Kitty McNaughton of Little River, so when we say the Geelong region, we're talking about a region, has resulted in multiple prizes. Um, the, the book, Kitty's War, is the, the book that um, was the manifestation of that thesis, winning prizes, including the New South Wales Premier's Award published by University of Queensland Press in 2013. The book is based on the diaries of Army nurse Kitty McNaughton, and as we're about to hear, it's more than a book about what one woman did in war, but about how one woman experienced and made sense of it, and how she communicated that experience back to her family in this part of the world. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Janet. Thank you, David, and thank you for everybody who's ventured out on this rainy Geelong day to hear about these two quite remarkable Geelong women and their experiences at war. 100 years ago today, on the 29th of April 1916, Little River nurse Kit McNaughton was sitting in a bell tent in a hospital camp just outside the French port of Marseille. It was cold and wet, the rations were short and plain, I haven't seen a vegetable since I arrived here, she wrote in her diary. She was decked out in what she called her Lemnos gear. Let's see if it works. Ah, there it is. There she is. This is Kit on Lemnos Island in the gear. They, they were so cold that they were given army gear to wear. And this is Kit on the left. In the middle is Geelong train nurse Evelyn Davies, who was also on the island. The great coats and boots issued to nurses who'd served there in what were very harsh conditions. The other nurses, she wrote in Marseille, were filled with envy. Kitt's military hospital, the second Australian general, had just arrived in France from Egypt. They had accompanied the first Anzac Corps, who were being moved in the wake of Gallipoli to the Western Front. The hospital was stationed at Marseille temporarily to act as a filter for the Anzac soldiers who were flooding into the French port from Egypt on their way to the battlefields in the north. The British were quite afraid of the diseases that had spread amongst the Anzac troops on Gallipoli and in Egypt. So the hospital was there as a filter for them and every time um, a ship sailed, it took a week to get to Marseille, the diseases would manifest themselves and a quota of men would be sent to Kitt's Hospital. Kitt and her fellow nurses walked in the pine forest marvelling at the wildflowers after Cairo, like a fairy tale, Kit wrote, of the butterflies in the trees. She and her close friend Geelong nurse Ida Mockridge had French lessons in their tent by the light of two candles fluttering in the breeze. Made awful fools of ourselves, she wrote, and then two days later she said, feel more at sea than ever. On the 25th of April, the hospital had marked the first anniversary of the landings in Anzac Cove, and she headed the entry in her diary with a new term in inverted commas, Anzac Day. They worried about their boys and fretted at not being closer to them. 
Hear this PM that our boys are in action and are being wiped out wholesale up north, she wrote, and to think of them there wanting attention and us here. On this day, Kit had been nine months at war. She was already a veteran, no longer the same woman she'd been when she enlisted. Yet, as she brought her diary up to date and practised her French, she and her fellow nurses could have had no idea of what they were about to face for preparations were going on around them, and including them, for the operations on the Somme, the first day of which was nine weeks away. The names of its battles, Fromel, Pozier, Mouquet Farm, among them, were, to be, were about to enter not only the military history of our nation, but also the personal history of many of its families. Last year, our focus as a nation was very much on the anniversary of the landings at Gallipoli. I thought today we might cast our eyes ahead and, as Geelongites ourselves, consider the experience of an Australian during the song through the records of one of our own. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I found Kitty and about how she herself came to be in that tent in Marseille. Two generations after Kitty sailed away to war, I found her name, together with that of her cousin Sadie McIntosh, on the memorial gates to our sports ground in my hometown. I grew up in Lara and Kitty grew up in Little River, two small towns arguing about who has the best view of the Yuyangs and sharing a district memorial. The nurses were out of alphabetical order and under the names of the men that they'd gone to serve as modest in memory as I was to discover that they'd been in life. During these anniversary years, we've reflected why Kit and Sadie and all of those on all our monuments went away to war, on what their going meant to Australia at the time and what it should mean in our ideas about ourselves today. But as I stood there in front of that monument, in the place that Kitty and I both grew up, what I wanted to know was what it had meant to her. There's a real sense in which the tragedy and the scope and the consequences of the First World War can really only be grasped at the highest level, that of the total figures of the wounded, the overall schemes of battle, the collective experience that would ultimately become the story of Australia at war. I think we'll find this more as our attention turns to the Somme this year and to Passchendaele next year. But telescoping our view down from this overall picture to the level of the individual and the meaning they themselves made of their experience, as we're doing here today, opens up to us a different kind of knowledge of our nation's experience of war. It can uncover untold stories which have been cast into shadow by the legend of the frontline Anzac soldier. But it requires different kinds of sources. I trace Kit's family through our local RSL, I turned up on the doorsteps of all the branches of her family, bearing jars of homemade Anzac biscuits and lots of questions. They generously opened their photograph albums and their memories to me. I pieced together her early years through their stories and their family records. And there she is. This is my favourite picture of Kitty. It was taken by Willits of Geelong. Um, it was taken in 1900 and she was 16 years old. She was born in 1884, the granddaughter of a Scottish immigrant, a kilt maker from the Highlands, who settled in West Geelong before becoming a pioneering white settler in the Little River District. And this is all that remains of Kitty's family farm, Daly's, um, on the side of the Yangs, not the front where Lara is. Um, they recently put up a monument in Little River to all of the World War I nurses, but particularly Kate, Kit and Sadie, and they used the stones from Daly's for the base of the memorial. Economic circumstances required Kit's brothers to seek work outside the farm, and so too did she. She was listed as a probationary nurse at the Geelong Infirmary and Benevolent Asylum, as it was then, it's now the University Hospital. There it is in 1915. Um, in 1907, she was registered, she began her three months unpaid trial at 6.30 6 in the morning on the 27th of March 1909 and she graduated in 1912 and she's in the bottom left-hand corner as you're looking at her. 
She joined the Royal Victorian Trained Nurses Association and in the pages of their nursing journal, I discovered her working as a private nurse in Melbourne, as most nurses did then, then with an eight-month stint at Bensdale Hospital before enlisting in the wake of the Gallipoli landings in the Australian Army Nursing Service. The First World War was still very much a time when war and travel were the domain of men. The role of women was seen as supportive, one of quiet waiting and sacrifice on the home front, not active service on the battlefront. Nurses had to argue their case to go, and they and a small number of masseuses were the, essentially the only women accepted for active service with the Australian Army Nursing Service. Somewhere between the official figure of 2,289 and an estimated 2,500 nurses went on active service with the Army. Some 700 others, including some Geelong nurses, took themselves overseas to enlist with other Allied organisations, such as the British Queen Alexandria, Alexandra's Imperial Nursing Service, the Australian Volunteer Hospitals and the Scottish Women Hospitals. Cheryl Scott's work for the wonderful Osborne Park Association exhibition Our Anzac Nurses last year has shown that upwards of 70 nurses associated with Geelong went on active service overseas with one or the other of these organisations, and among them is Kitty. And I can still remember her granddaughter saying to me, you know she kept a diary. It's exactly the kind of source that I needed to answer my own questions about her experience of war and their effect upon her. And it's on Kit's diary that my book, Kitty's War, was based. In the pages of her diary, in effect looking over her shoulder as she wrote, I watched as she stood on a winter's day in July 1915. Oh, sorry, that's her just before embarkation in her new uniform. And there they are. These photographs were taken by Q photographer Josiah Barnes. Kitty's actually there. And I think she's right in the middle, but her, her nephew did tell me that it was Kit's practice to either look down, talk to somebody, or have it back to the camera. It was very hard to get actual photograph of her. She is actually there. Um, she was one of 60 nurses from Tasmania, Victoria, waiting to embark on her voyage to war. As preparations went forward to remove the gangways from the Orsava, she had to break away from her group of well-wishers and make a dash for the ship was almost left behind, she wrote, had to run up the pier. And that's the awesome believing. In common with many of her fellow nurses who also kept diaries, that first step was the very first moment in her life that she will record. And there's the first page of Kitty's diary. July 17th, 1915, she wrote, embarked on Orsava 10.30, signed on and returned to pier, met all the riverites and took fond farewell. And further down, afternoon tea, 4pm, officers and nurses together. Best fun of the day. Played around afterwards and fed Jacko the kangaroo. They had a kangaroo on board. As a mascot of a ship, concert given by troops on deck and returned by nurses, also boxing matching progress. The whole show is just like a nice big picnic. Kit's diary was a gift on departure from one of her fellow nurses, Ethel Buchanan. And you can see it's um, to dearest Kit, with love and best wishes from Ethel. It was intended to be a travel diary, a place where Kit was expected to record her traveller's tales for the entertainment and education of the audience at home. The idea of a diary as a secret place for our innermost thoughts is very much a mid-20th century thing. This was more like the kind of photograph album that we would have presented for our family or, I guess, a Facebook page that our children would set up for their holidays. There is quite clearly a you to whom Kit McNaughton's diary is addressed. We often think of the people at home and wonder what you're all doing, she wrote eight days out from Melbourne. And if you could only see us all doing the grand, you would know how we were enjoying ourselves. Kit's mindful of her audience as she writes, and this explains not only what we see in her diary, but as I was to discover, also what we do not see. She arrived in Egypt on the 11th of August 1915, in time to nurse the flood of wounded from the August offensive on the Dardanelles. She was assigned to the number two Australian General Hospital in the converted Gazira Palace Hotel located on an island in the Nile. And it still exists. There it is today. 
It's now the Marriott Hotel. She recorded, The night we arrived, 800 patients came from Gabatepe, and most of them were seriously wounded, poor boys, but also brave. So we just got here in time. They were coming in from 11pm to 3am, just one continual hum of motor ambulances. Some have died, but they all get the greatest of care, and very bad cases, a special nurse. Sister Olive Haynes, already at the hospital and soon to become a close friend of Kit's, commented on the difference from home. She wrote in her own diary that if they admitted two or three accidents at once in the Adelaide Hospital, as she wrote, we thought we were killed. Life in Egypt represented contrast in other ways as well. On her first day, Kit met some nurses and a doctor from Geelong. Monday the 16th, she wrote, went to Cairo, went to Groppies, the place for Isis, and there met Doris Richards, Trevord and Captain Cole. Trevord and Cole are to be married on Thursday. Lily Trevord had qualified at Geelong Hospital and Dr George Cole was a senior resident there. Social life in Cairo was a far cry from the Geelong Infirmary and Benevolent Asylum. The House Committee had made it clear during Kit's training that, and I quote, throughout the whole staff it is to be fully understood that all private and unnecessary conversation between the sexes is against the wish of the governing body. When in March of the following year the matron happened upon Dr Dunstan, who was a junior resident, walking in the afternoon in Eastern Park with training nurse Williams, it was regarded as a serious breach of hospital etiquette and the chairman interviewed them both. Australians in active service kept an eye out for those from their home district visiting them and sending news of them home to be shared among local families. At Gallipoli in September, one officer would write that the men have taken to pencilling the name of their hometown on their hat bands. To be a Geelongite or a Riverite was part of the identity that the soldiers and nurses from the district took to war with them. And others from home met on active service were a physical link to the community in a strange land and in the daunting world of war. Throughout the war, Kit would record these meetings in her diary. So she visited Geelong nurse Winnie Galilland, who was nursing in nearby Alexandria with the British, and was herself visited when ill by Geelong boy George Trujillo of the 14th Battalion. She recorded, I wrote to his mother to tell her I'd seen him. Most important for Kit was her meeting three weeks after her arrival with Geelong nurse Ida Mockridge who had been assigned to the same hospital, was going along the hall and someone grabbed me and said, Kitty Mac, Kitty Mac, she wrote. Great excitement, it was Sister Mockridge. I was just delighted to see her as she is a perfect dear. To have a special pal was vitally important to women in terms of their experience of the war. Friends provided a buffer and support, an anchor in an unfamiliar world, and Ida Mockridge would become a lifelong friend. And there's a group of the nurses, um, Kit's second from the left in the back and Ida's fourth from the left in the back. They're a group of the friends, that's the roof of the Gazira Palace. Not only social life represented a contrast with life at the Geelong Infirmary, the nurses embraced some other thoroughly modern behaviours. Kit had longed for a camera on board and she acquired one in Egypt. She printed her own photographs, like all the other nurses, and this view of the Nile was actually taken by Kit and printed by her and it survived to today. But there was more. All the nurses here smoke like fun, Kit wrote, wide-eyed at the end of her first week. Seems part of their life. Having made it clear to her diary's audience that her own forays into smoking would not make her racy beyond the norm, she proceeded to record her own indulgence. There was an acceptance of smoking being a comfort for soldiers on active service and the nurses may have felt more open to, more able to openly embrace this activity because they too were on active service. Nevertheless, as her nephew would recall, Little River would fall in a collective faint when she and her cousin Sadie, also currently in Egypt, came home from the war, got off the train, and as he said, both were smoking. Ideas about a woman's place meant that nurses were expected to serve in these general hospitals, in base um, centres far behind the front lines. 
The nurses, of course, wanted to be as close as possible to their boys, and the changing conditions of the Gallipoli campaign meant that some of them could get their wish. After a month in Cairo, on Saturday the 11th of September 1915, Kit wrote in her diary that she and Ida had, and I quote, volunteered for work at Lemnos, and their names were read out at dinner. We are just delighted. Two days later, they and 23 other nurses travelled by train from Cairo to Alexandria. There's Kit in what she called a Gary, a horse-drawn vehicle, on her way to the station. At Alexandria, they boarded an English hospital ship, the SS Assay, and steamed 650 miles across the Mediterranean to the island of Lemnos, which was situated 50 miles off Gallipoli. So if you follow up the dotted line with 650 miles, it's right up to the top, you see Lemnos. It took the wounded four days to get from Gallipoli to Cairo, which is why they were establishing the hospitals on Lemnos. And of course, many of them weren't surviving the voyage. To research Kit's time at war, I traced both official documents relating to each unit in which she served, but also the diaries and the letters and the memoirs of the nurses and doctors who served with her. My aim had been to build up a kind of vivid picture of life in, in these units, but comparison with Kit's own diary of Lemnos brought to light something rather unexpected. Kit wasn't telling the whole story in her diary. An early thinker about diaries, Robert Fothergill, has written that of all the things that happen in their day, a diarist actually records very few. Kit made choices about what to say and how to say it within an overlapping set of social rules that governed what topics women should write about, what a travel diary should contain, who her audience was, and in the eyes of that audience, the acceptable image at the time of the good woman and especially the good nurse as modest, self-effacing and self-sacrificing. So on Lemnos, with social life an acceptable topic for women, Kit wrote of the rich social life that developed between the soldiers who were resting and recovering on the island and the nurses who were very much in demand. Kit's diary of her time would illuminate the nature and the importance of friendship beyond the iconic idea of mateship between men. It would reveal the friendship between the nurses themselves and between nurses and soldiers on the island as vital sources of solace and support for those on active service. To the soldiers, the Australian nurses were sisters in arms and sisters from home. For friends met here, Kit would assemble a substitute war family of nurses and soldiers who would see her through the dark times of war. That's Kit on Lemnos with the tents behind her in the bay. And there's Kit and Ida, Ida on the left, Kit on the right with some soldiers that she'd met on, on Lemnos Island. That's from Evelyn Davies' photograph album. Invisible, however, in Kit's diary is the fact that on Lemnos Island, Kit and her fellow nurses endured living conditions so harsh that nurses from other units actually died. They suffered from inadequate food, clothing and shelter, as well as disease and overwork. Uh, this was taken by Olive Haynes. This is the tents that they slept, eight to a tent. They were so cold in them that in the end, by October, they were sleeping together on stretches to try and keep warm. They received difficult treatment as well at the hands of the hospital's all-male staff, who regarded them as out of place so close to the front, where male nursing orderlies were the norm. There were four different kinds of hospitals sent from Australia. The general, nurse, the general hospitals, which had nurses, and quite a lot of them, and three different kinds of hospitals, um, field hospitals, clearing stations and stationary hospitals, which were strung out along the lines of communication or right on the front line, and they only had male nursing orderlies because it was felt that nurses, female nurses should not be that close to the front. And, of course, Lemnos was, in effect, an advanced base, and the hospital was inside a hospital camp, which also made it a bit of a no-no for female nurses. There were a number of factors that kept the nurses silent in their letters and diaries. They wanted to prove that they were not too soft for active service near the front, so they weren't going to complain. In their letters and diaries, they wanted to spare their readers as well, because they were treating the wounded Australian or the wounded soldiers of the Allies. So there was very little reference in her diaries to wounded men. 
Censorship was another reason that the conditions on Lemnos didn't, ap didn't appear in letters. In a piece of serendipity, while on Lemnos, Ida Mockridge found in a pocket of a pair of Red Cross pyjamas a letter from Mrs Humble of the Geelong Red Cross. The Geelong Red Cross had been formed within months of the war beginning. In, in September 1915, in response to an urgent call, or by September 1915, they'd sent 4,270 pairs of pyjamas to Government House, and one of them had ended up on Lemnos Island. Ida wrote the author a charming thank you note, ending with the casual suggestion that Mrs Humble might send a box direct to Lemnos for the boys for Christmas from Geelong Red Cross workers. I think they would get it quicker than if it went to Alexandria, she said, and address it to me for them. It would be lovely. She didn't tell Mrs Humble why they were so needed. Most importantly, though, the norms of the, of the time about a woman's place together with their expected qualities of modesty and self-effacement, meant that a focus on themselves and their own work in their diaries was not expected to be a subject of their diary. The diaries were for the use of other people. Historian Kirsty Harris has undertaken a study of First World War nursing practice because she said, despite all of the letters and the diaries that we're blessed with in Australia, the actual work of the nurses is an invisible practice. A hidden occupation, she called it. Kit's diary, then, is of particular value because its character as a travel diary, in combination with an accident of fate, meant that for one part of her service, the door on her wards and her work was suddenly thrown completely open. On the evacuation of Gallipoli, Kit and her fellow nurses were sent back from, from their hospital on Lemnos to Egypt, and from there to France, where we originally met her outside Marseille. There were never enough nurses on the Western Front, um, partly because, although we enlisted for the duration, the British nurses could go home after six months, and they tended to. So there was a big turnover. In late June 1916, as part of the preparations for the oncoming operations of the Somme, Kit and Ida were lent as reinforcements to a British hospital, the number eight stationery, in Boulogne Base in the north. Here, wounded German soldiers of war, prisoners of war, were concentrated and treated, and Kit was assigned to their wards. They were concentrated in one hospital because it stopped all hospitals needing guards for them. She called the wards Bosch's Alley and the men in them, the severely wounded soldiers of the enemy, she would eventually come to call My Old Huns. The number eight station was located at Vimero, a large village, 10 minutes by tram road from Boulogne. And there, that's the number eight station. You can see the tram line in the far right. All around Vimero, a future matron of number two Australian general would write, there are hospitals, each taking over 1,000 beds, in fact, wherever one goes, you see tents and huts. On arrival, Kit McNaughton wrote that her hospital was in a glorious position right on top of the cliffs, and you can see the cliffs of Dover on a fine day, they tell me. We see plenty of shipping going past. She added that they also heard an occasional bombardment. She wrote that the wards are glorious, just like a big general hospital at home, 30 beds in each hut and every convenience. The hospital is laid out splendidly and kept so well it's a perfect picture and a credit to the man who laid it out. Like all nurses, she loved order. In the last days of June 1916, Kit walked along the cliffs, it was light until 10pm, and had supper with the hospital's Scottish nurses, although not the English ones. She shopped in Boulogne and was visited by Geelong nurses Jean Buckham, who was serving with the Australian Voluntary Hospital, and Winnie Gilliland, who'd moved to France with the British QAs. It's like the old Geelong infirmary, she commented. At zero hour, 7.30am, on the 1st of July 1916, on a 30-kilometre front north of the Somme River, men of 22 divisions rose up and advanced in an almost continuous line into no man's land. On that day, 58,000 of them became casualties. On the 3rd of July, this tidal wave of wounded men hit Boulogne base full force. Kit wrote a hurried account with no time for grammar, which reflects both the pace of the day and her shock. The 3rd, 
No time off today, nothing but convoy after the other and evacuating at the same time some awful wounds. I hadn't time to draw breath all day. The news from the front is great, but the slaughter must be awful and the wounds are terrible. During the Somme, Kit's nursing of wounded prisoners of war meant that the taboos which operated in other parts of the diary on her work and on the wounded were lifted. Part of the reason is that German prisoners were a topic that her audience might be interested in, and they were not Allied soldiers. So six days later, giving us a glimpse into her ward and herself at work, she would write, Sunday, as I came on, I saw Huns sailing into my ward, had 45 in the hut, such chaos I have never beheld, and they had to have their wounds dressed and be clothed ready to go by 12 midday. I simply flew from one to the other with a dressing table. The look of the ward was the limit. It was cutting off bandages and clothes and dressings all over the place. Today, in Kitt's home state of Victoria, the proportion of nurses to patients in a, an acute surgical ward, which this was, is one to four. Kit would remain the lone trained nurse in her overcrowded ward from June until October. The nature of her patients also lifted the taboo on the description of the wounds which reigns in the rest of the diary. Allied soldiers, even in extreme circumstances, she would only ever describe broadly as being, and I quote, knocked about frightfully. In the press at home, illustrations of the gruesome effects of war were banned as likely to prejudice recruiting. In her diary, for herself and for her audience, Kit McNaughton equated the large number of severely wounded Germans with Allied success. On the 6th of July, she could write, I have 11 with their legs off and a couple ditto arms and hips and heads galore and the awful smell from the wounds is a limit as this gas gangrene is the most awful thing imaginable. A leg goes in a day. It was something, gas gangrene was something they never saw in civil practice, except in the kind of accident where a bus would run over somebody. So they, it was very rare. The wounds themselves were shocking to Kit. Instead of the gunshot wounds and infectious diseases she'd met in Egypt and on Lemnos, um, these were caused by high explosive shells. The fields of France had been manured for centuries and the shell fragments drove toxins deep into the body. So equally shocking to a nurse trained in aseptic or germ-free surgery was the state of the wounds. They were universally septic on arrival. But of course what Kit's allowing us to see are the kinds of wounds inflicted on the Western Front, irrespective of a soldier's country and allegiance. Interestingly, at the end of her description, she added, I extracted a bullet from a German's back today. I enjoyed cutting into him. The bullet is my small treasure, as I hope it saved a life as it was a revolver one. And the revolvers were carried by officers, so one would assume it would be shot at relatively close range. The actual performance of surgical procedures was not part of a nurse's training or official practice before the war, and nor has it been since. But Kit was able to show herself stepping outside the boundaries of a nurse and performing the work of the much higher status British doctors at the number eight stationery, confident that there would be no queries raised because her patients were the wounded soldiers of the enemy. She was not able to show herself using the scalpel on Allied troops, although chances are very high that she did so. Effie Garden and May Tilton would both admit that they had used the scalpel in operating theatres, uh, but they couldn't admit it at the time. Even though Cook, Kit couldn't write about it at the time, um, nothing could change the fact that she'd done it and that um, it would increase her self-esteem and also her idea about what a nurse was capable of. And it did cause her a few hiccups down the track when she argued with the doctors, which was unheard of in Australia. In this British hospital as well, we see Kitty defining her growing sense of Australianness with some friction against the Imperial staff. The place is bound in red tape from end to end, she wrote, and the people are as stiff as starch. At the same time, though, she was finding the limits of national difference in a sense of common humanity with the enemy soldiers she was nursing. She was mentioned in dispatches by General Sir Douglas Haig for her gallantry in the field for nursing the enemy wounded during the song. As the song drew to a close, she moved back to her old unit, number two Australian General, 
who, which was now situated a mixture of huts and tented wards across the road. She was a bit worried. She said that the, um, they'd cause a stir when they got going across the road, given the, the very sort of um, obedient conditions in the British hospital. It was somewhat more relaxed, the number two stationary. The emphasis of scholars of the First World War until recently has been on the divisions between the two fronts, the home and the battlefront. A focus on Kit and her home community, however, highlights also the vital connections that existed between the two fronts, the crisscrossing networks of communication across and between them. Letters from the battlefront have received the most attention, mainly because lovingly treasured by anxiously waiting people at home, or published in the Geelong Advertiser under headings such as News of Our Geelong Soldiers, they've survived. But studies of two-way wartime correspondence by historians such as Martha Hanna for France, Crystal Hamill for Germany, and Michael Roper and Jenny Hartley for England have revealed the functional importance of mail from home in the emotional and practical well-being of those at war. Like all in active service, Kip recorded the letters from home, her budgets of news, as she called them, and her delight in receiving them. Ethel Daly, who lived in Little River, Kit wrote her mother from Lemnos, was sending her a parcel. I'm just longing for it to come, she wrote, as there are all sorts of nice things in it. They treasured the local paper and scoured it for news. The Joang advertiser um, was quite forceful that most of the newspapers sent to the front were News of the Weeks, which it published. Under the headline, Send News of the Week to the Front, while Kit was in Marseille, the Geelong Advertiser declared that this week's issue will inform them as to the marvellous success of the Sporting Carnival and the Geelong West Gymkhana and the sale of the Grand School site, which ends a controversy that interested every man now at the front. So there was a flow of information to the front as well as back from it. Australian soldiers and nurses could be away from home for four years, and letters from families in Geelong filled with every microscopic bit of local gossip, as Jenny Hartley's written, kept those in active service woven into the fabric of their community and helped maintain their civilian identities and sustained bonds of affection. And this, it was this flow of information from Geelong which actually solved a mystery for me, one of the deep silences in Kit McNaughton's diary. Kitty, as an Australian woman, was entitled, she was enfranchised, she could vote. So she was entitled to vote in both of the conscription plebiscites on the Western Front in 1916 and in 1917. She was one of the few women on the Western Front who was entitled to vote. And it was the kind of event that she would have liked writing about her participation in. It was a common topic in the nurses' letters and diaries and in soldiers' letters homes as well. Her friend Olive Haynes, who was an Anglican minister's daughter from the city of Adelaide, was all for conscription. But Kit's own letters from home would have made it clear that Little River, for a mixture of religious, political and very practical economic reasons, and against the tide of the state, was going to vote no. Her own brother, cousins and future husband were included. So Kit, a farmer's daughter and a member of the Roman Catholic minority, and seeing the friends she'd made amongst the soldiers on a treadmill of being wounded and returning to the front, maintained a rigid and probably conflicted silence on the subject. She never mentioned conscription. And Little River voted 36-4, 53 against, one informal, and 39 people, of course, were already at war from a, a community of 300. In August 1917, Kit was moved from the Second Australian Journal to an Australian clearing station which was about 7,000 yards from the front line. Um, these are soldiers um, who, that are being moved to on a light rail to a train in the background to be evacuated to the base. They've already been treated at the clearing station. By this time, the Valley of Nurses had been proved without question. They were performing operations at the clearing stations. They needed the nurses there for the soldiers to survive. She arrived in the early days of the Third Battle of Eat, which Australians remember as Passchendaele. Here she was in charge of the operating theatres. 
Um, for those of you who saw Anzac Girls, Kit took over from Alice Ross King, who was evacuated as being too long in a clearing station, which I think was code for shell shocked. The Australian soldiers had all been moved up to this area and they were arriving on the operating table still in their car key. But the door behind which Kit would go about her work at this clearing station was firmly shut. Here life at the extreme edge of war took on a surreal quality. As Kit wrote instead about the Australian soldiers helping to bring in the harvest in the fields around them. There they are and of visits from friends. In September, she wrote that they were sitting outside watching Fritz shell the observation balloon, as she was wont to do for entertainment, and who should come around the corner, she wrote, but good old Ted Connop from Little River. And there he is. I nearly fell over in my rush to meet the kid, and he looks well and bonny and brown and just the same nice boy. What she never records, though she must have known, is that less than a month later, Ted Connett was dead. Five days later, so was his brother. It was left to her sister-in-law, Min, back in Little River, to walk up to Mrs Connop on two successive days as the news arrived to tell her that her sons were gone. Though Kit would not, or could not, write more than six sentences about her actual work here, a Royal Red Cross First Class would later be awarded for her service at the clearing station. In December, as winter set in, and that's winter at the clearing station, she said she'd never seen anything like it, there was a, an orderly who was quite poetical at the clearing station who wrote about the sun reflecting off um, the frost and she, he said, I've never seen anything like it. And she wrote in her diary, and I never want to again. Kit and I had left the CCS for leave in England. It was policy then to, for the matron in chief to retain World War nurses in England. And the two nurses served for a time at the Australian Convalescent Hospital in Dartford in Kent. And there's Kit in the middle and Ida's on her left. And she wrote in her diary, it's such a joy to see the bonny men, our bonny men, so cheerful and not in pain. And later, it's all very different from the clearing station. Kit would end the war, helping to repair the shattered faces of Australian soldiers as Australia's first plastic surgery nurse at the Queen's Hospital, which was a special Commonwealth facial and axillary hospital in Sidcombe in Kent. Of course, the, the soldiers' helmets were protected protected their head, but nothing protected their faces, and there were some very confronting wounds. Gertrude Moberly, who was a fellow nurse, visited Kit, and she recorded in her memoirs that after leaving, she sat in the gutter and cried and cried. The apathy of Kit's diary at this stage of the war suggests that she was experiencing what we would now refer to as post-traumatic stress. That her service did have an effect can be seen in photographs. The picture of Kit that we saw in the beginning, oh, that's her, that's Kit at Sidcup. The man sitting in between the nurses, Kit's on the left, the man in the middle is Sir Henry Newland, Colonel Newland as he was then, Sir Henry Newland as, as he was after the war. Um, he made his reputation as a plastic surgeon. He worked in Adelaide and his grandson, also called Henry Newland, is also a plastic surgeon. But behind Kit, directly behind her, third in on the second row, is Daryl Lindsay from Ballarat, who was an artist of the Lindsay family, and he was sent to Sidcup to make watercolour paintings of the stages of the reconstruction of the men's faces, which could take, you know, 18 months and many, many operations. But to return to Kit, there's a photograph that we saw of her at age 16. It shows a girl of some confidence, certain of her status, with perhaps a touch of the dry humour that I would later find in her diaries. She's still evident in a second photograph, which shows her at the age of 29, 18 months before she went to war. In December, this is taken in December 1913. In contrast, a photo taken in June 1918 and sent home to her new sister-in-law, Min, four and a half years later shows a change. Thinner in the face, she's smiling slightly, but the expression in her eyes is one of great pain and sadness. Like the boys who had never come home, 
The girl who looked back at the camera with such confidence and amusement is gone. Kit McNaughton's hair was grey, in common with most of the nurses and soldiers, whatever their age, at this stage of the war. Evelyn Davies, at the age of 34, was nearly white. Kit came home as head sister on the troop ship Wiltshire in July 1990. It's a lovely photograph of her sitting in the funnel. I'll be home before the wattle blooms this year, she wrote to me. She arrived almost four years to the day since her departure. Like her fellow nurses, she paid a high price for her service. Two stone lighter, she was in ill health, having contracted paratyphoid, diphtheria and pleurodynia during her service. Little River resident Nori Warren told me that she saw Kit and Sadie come home from the war and they were both, she said, done women. But there, there were some happy times. This, I found this in Kit's nephew's photograph album. That's Kit in the middle, Ida on the, on the right, and Ida's sister Myrtle at Barwon Heads at Christmas in 1919. It's been colourised, mm. but it's quite beautiful. Unlike the majority of return nurses, Kit married, and that's probably one reason why her diary has survived. She married the man she dreamt about on the way to war, Joe Ryan of Little River, who in a reversal of the normal situation had not enlisted. They had three children. Like most of the nurses, she never nursed again, although the, she was called to the local children when they were ill because the, the doctor was seven miles away in Werribee. And I met one of her patients, who was then when I spoke to him in his 80s, and she, he said, we did what she told us. <laughs> she rolled her own cigarettes until she died. She never missed an Anzac Day. That's her in the very late 40s, just before she died. She's wearing the Royal Red Cross and her three First World War medals on the way to Anzac Day. She passed away in 1953. On the day of her funeral, a notice appeared in the paper. Inserted by her friend Ida Mockridge, it said. Like the military ceremony at her graveside and the newspaper articles which lauded her as a rose of no man's land, the notice in the paper emphasised the importance of her war service in her life. Its message, 38 years after she sailed away to war, was simple. A tribute to the memory of Kitty, named McNaughton, 1st AIF. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks very much, Sarah. That was a, a, a wonderful journey uh, with you and Kit. Um, I love to talk about that. No, look, it was, it was fantastic and um, really enjoyed the way in which both through the diary entries and through your analysis we got this this sense of um, Kit and her communities. Obviously the, the strong ties with the, mm. the local community persisted, the way in which she located herself within communities near the front. Mm. Um, and also the kind of readership that was in her mind always when she was writing it. Wonderful. We have some time for questions, please. I can talk more. Um, was that picture of the soldiers collecting the, the harvest, was that in France, was it? Yes, it was. So the diggers... They did. They helped the French bring in the harvest. And she said they looked happy because a lot of them were in rural and background themselves. And, of course, the French men were away at the war as well. The women were bringing in the harvest and they were really struggling. You know, it was the older women and the wives left behind, so... These are the stories you don't hear in uh, conventional history. No, it's not. And, and she said they, they, you know, that was one thing she talked about. In the, her diary of the clearing station, it's, it's eight pages long. She was there for quite a long time. You wouldn't know she was a nurse from reading it. Um, all she talked about was she was kind of detached a bit. I think she was already a little bit, you know, stressed by the song. And she talked about, that's what she talked about, um, travelling around to collect the laundry with the matron, seeing the soldiers in the field bringing in the harvest, um, friends that were visiting her from the Australian divisions. They come on a Sunday afternoon for afternoon tea and visit the nurses. And they were jumbled together. So she would say, I had a visit from Ted Connock, so-and-so ran into somebody else in a shell hole and was reminded, you know, 
said he wanted to be remembered to me. Um, I'd heard about the death of somebody and we went to an afternoon tea at an artillery and it was bomb, she said. It was, it was, it became very odd, her diary. It's quite detached and I think normal life had become a very long way away because I'm right on the very edge of war. You, you can understand that emotional detachment because it would be a necessary survival mechanism. You couldn't be in that sort of situation and uh, you know, emotionally overwhelmed if you were able to detach and be able to keep on functioning. I think, I think that's true and they kept a very close eye on the nurses up at the um, clearing station and um, if they felt they, they were too long there, they were supposed to be there three months. I think Kit was there a bit over four. Um, they would ship them out. And at least two nurses whose diaries I've read were shell-shocked. One of them was Alice Ross King and the other one was Anne Donnell. They just broke down from being there, from the sites that they saw, and, which they don't write about at all. It's interesting the little bits and pieces of nature that she relates to too. Yes. Butterflies and birds and flowers and things too. It's like focus on something outside the horror of the world. Then you can't feel too often. Like Oh, that, that's a, a really good point because you see that in all of their diaries. The soldiers too, they focus on nature um, and you're right. You can tell um, where somebody came from because when as she's going up to the clearing station, she's noticing the crops. She writes what crops are in the fields. Whereas um, Mildred Crocker-Brown, who's a friend of hers who goes up to the clearing station, talks about how straight the road is. She grew up in Manly. <laughs> So she said it was built on the Roman roads. So you can tell where they come from, all the country people. They're very interested in um, the harvesting methods, particularly in Egypt, you know, how they're bringing up the water, how they're harvesting. Um, they, they can tell. She said she travelled down from Luxor in the train to Cairo and she said the crops are much further ahead down here than they are up in, in um, Luxor. So... You're right, though. It was bound to their soul, I think, looking at nature, even in the worst circumstances. Uh, thanks very much. That's a terrific talk. Um, the, uh, you said it was very interesting. I had never thought about the idea that, of course, they were treating German soldiers and German yes. officers. And you said that sense of common humanity comes through her diary. Is that reflected in other nurses' diary? And do you have any evidence about how she felt about... Germans after her return, because we so easily fall into that. Uh, yes, they were hated we so do. What, what, that's so that a, that's very a very good question. That, that sense of common humanity there, which we don't really see much in the history. No, we don't. But I don't think it was that. I don't think that many nurses experienced it, which was um, they had an overflow of German wounded soldiers by this stage. Her own hospital had moved across the road and there was an overflow of German wounded soldiers and they went to the um, second stationery and it shows the interest that it had for people that a matron who was writing very short sections in her diary about her service and sending it home as a letter devoted the whole entry to these soldiers because they were high in interest. But to go back to your point of the common humanity, when Kit first received these soldiers in her diary, in her ward, she um, was anti-German, basically, because of the we had a lot of anti-German propaganda. The Lusitania had been sunk with the children and women on board. News had just come of a, a prisoner of war camp in Germany um, where, which was run by doctors and it was riddled with typhus, people were dying and they all knew that of course where typhus is it means there's terrible conditions. So they were very, they were very anti-German because she said we were giving them the best of treatment and look how they're treating our people. But you see as the days go by, Kit loses that and it happens very quickly. She, um, she starts to see them as, as other people um, and then she starts getting upset because they're dying she's the, she's the only nurse in there they're severely wounded if they weren't they wouldn't be being looked after in the hospital and of course they're dying they're, they're dying more in her ward than they are in any other part of the hospital and she's she's saying you know I'm just sick to death of the way they're dying nothing will save them which which kind of implies that she's doing everything she possibly can to save them um, when they go to leave, because as an Allied soldier gets better, they're shipped off one by one. 
but they have to wait for a, a group of Germans to be sent away together under guard. And so they're there in, the, in her ward for a very long time. And they come up and they give her presents, like little buttons, and she said their eyes just filled up with tears and they're all going to write to her. And she said, I can see myself being shot as a spy. <laughs> and she was. Um, she actually said to her nephew, I'm um, sorry, her son-in-law after the war, that she actually preferred nursing those wounded Germans than she did nursing wounded Tommies because the language, she said, was unbelievable of the Tommies. Um, but she... What also happened after the song, which is a much similar thing, she talks in her diary about how odd it is that they're at each other's throats one day and they're having a... Because as prisoners will go out and give the guards a cup of tea and they'll have a cigarette together. She says, look at them. They're talking to each other. And they see a, a, an observation balloon of the Germans um, shot down and the person in it is sort of coming down in flames, a German, and she said in her diary, he's only doing his job just like us. And so she changed. And what had happened was that it was happening relatively across the board. So there started to be regulations coming in during the song, preventing people from fraternising with the German prisoners, swapping buttons, all that sort of thing, collecting souvenirs, because it was humanising the, the Germans, and there was enough apathy after the song, um, enough people not wanting the war to go on without the soldiers themselves thinking, who are we fighting? They're people just like us. So you start seeing those regulations in her own hospital as well, preventing people from, you know, they're prevented from working as orderlies. They were getting them to work as orderlies, the German prisoners, but they stopped it because people were getting to know them and they were realising they're just people like us and it was it's interesting that at the time she's she was born into the colony of Victoria which most of the soldiers except for the 14 year olds um, most of the soldiers and nurses who went to the war weren't born into Australia they were born into colonies and they had very strong colonial loyalties and kids you could see it in the war saying it's no wonder those people are suffering they're being nursed by New South Welshmen um, New South Wales nurses and she's kind of crystallising that idea of Australian identity as after Gallipoli. But at the very same time, she herself is discovering there are limits to that, you know, that we're all just people. So. Oh, Janet, I was just wondering, did Kitty ever express feelings about being Australian? No, no. She's always very proud. Out the yes, very, very proud. Yes. No, her family didn't want her to be a nurse. Um, her nephew said he felt she trained as a nurse to avoid cooking for the shearers. <laughs> she, she didn't want a life of that. And there was very little that women, as you know, that women could do. They could be teachers, they could be nurses. So, no, I think she was out of there, you know, wanted to, tr you know, experience what life had. A couple of questions. Ian, Ian Idrius uh, wrote when he was at Gallipoli that um, when, when they get pulled, the Australian troops came up with the ideas, they'd have two poles and they put a bed sheet on it and they'd paint a target on it and they'd hold up the search and shoot that. Oh, that's funny. And if they if they hit the bullseye, they, they'd clap them and if they miss the target, they'd jeer them. And um, if the officers found out about them, it, it was So I'm just wondering, did she have any dealings with wounded Turkish soldiers? That's the first question. And... The second question is, I know that Australian nurses from World War I were treated appalling when they came back. They weren't recognised, no, they, they weren't, weren't. Uh, funded in any way financially, they weren't financially supported. Did she have any thoughts about that at all? Yes, to, yes to both of those um, questions. On Lemnos Island, she didn't, um, she didn't write that she treated Turkish prisoners of war, but the Turkish prisoners of war were on Lemnos and she said, I went for a walk and we went past the prisoner of war camp. They were busy wiring themselves in, she said. So they didn't have to, I don't think they had to be guarded very hard. But I will tell you a funny story about the target. Olive Haynes wrote um, that um, the Germans held up a sign on the Western Front. The soldiers had told Olive, the nurse, and the sign said, Gott mit uns, which is, you know, God is with us. And the Tommies held up a sign that said, we've got mittens too. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
which I thought was quite funny. Uh, now, what was the second question? The second question was whether the nurses came back, they weren't oh, yes. actually... Uh, they were, no, they didn't. And the, and the main problem that they faced was financial because they were very unwell. 345 of them were discharged as medically unfit and some of the others, or, or a majority of the others were sent off as okay, but the problems arose thereafter. They tried to work, but they were exhausted. They were a lot older than the boys when they went, so when they came back, they were in at least their mid-30s. Um, most of the men in the cohort of people they would marry had either been killed, they brought home war brides, or they were so injured that they weren't going to marry. If they did marry, they might marry a soldier who they would be res financially responsible for because a soldier had been damaged by his war service, but they were doing it on half pay because women only got half pay. Um, Kit battled. Um, she was lucky in that she got diphtheria and it was recognised while she was at war and it weakened her heart. Um, and so she got a third of a pension, but... <coughs> It was adjusted, like, you know, every three months you go to the doctor and they put it up and they put it down. In the end it was stabilised at, at um, a third of the pay. But she also had um, prolapse injuries that she said were from lifting the soldiers, which almost certainly they were, but, and a number of other nurses too, but they, were all, they all said no to that. Nurses weren't able to be treated in... Um, repatriation hospitals, whereas the wives of soldiers were. And I think it was not until the 70s, when most of the nurses had gone to God, that they were able to be given um, nursing home care at the, at the government's expenses. They paid a very high price for their service, you know, most of the nurses. They lived in genteel poverty, really. Um, there's a, a fund called the Edith Cavell Fund, which the nurses applied to for help. Kit didn't, um, and Ida didn't, because she worked running a private hospital in Surrey Hills with two sisters. But um, Sadie McIntosh had to. Um, yeah. And do we have any of Kit's writings on how he felt about that? Um, no, what we do have, um, and, and what we have for, I guess, most of the soldiers is the best source for this, if they, because they tended to stop writing the diary even before they came home. Um, there are very few diaries of the journey home because, you know, they're coming home with, with these really darknesses inside them, missing, leaving so many people behind. There's nothing joyful. They're, so they're quite, the, the home journals on the troop ships are quite bitter and dark. In their, in their sort of feel. Um, so they tend not to have written anything like diaries and journals about their time after the war. What we do have are the repatriation files where they're trying to get help and they're writing letters or their daughters are writing letters saying, my mother is really ill, she's served a country, why can't we get help? She, she believes that this is war-related. So that's, you know, one of our few sources, but it is a good one. Yeah. Okay. Um, it relates to what you're saying. Does that mean because of the, the state that they were in when they returned and the treatment they got, that there was no sort of flow on um, effect of that skill development in their nursing practice? Did that not really um, flow on to the nursing that's practice? A, that's a good question, yeah, to, too. To any extent. It, look, it did, but not to the extent that it would have been good because Kit, it's funny, um, I didn't realise this, but. Um, operating theatre nurses were quite quite rare at the time before the war. Um, Ida Mockridge actually left um, Geelong Hospital because she wanted a better job somewhere else. And the matron said, we need to give her a pay rise to keep her. And the committee said, no, because they were cash-strapped. And the matron had to say, she's the only nurse that we've got that can work in an operating theatre. When Kit got to Dartford... Um, they put a nurse in the operating theatre and she just fell apart. And the matron said, we can't have these girls in there. They just can't do it. They're not physically capable of operating theatre work. So Kit had worked in operating theatres in a clearing station and in a plastic surgery unit. But when she came home, she never nursed again. And a lot of those nurses had those new skills that they picked up at war. They weren't passed on, but some of them, some of the nurses went back into the hospitals. They became matrons 
And they were the ones that encouraged the nurses who then became the Second World War nurses. So the matrons of the major hospitals in Melbourne were generally ex-AIF. And they also, this is something about the, the nurses' experience at war, before they went to war, they were so self-sacrificing that they, their pay hadn't gone up for 20 years. And when they got a pay rise, they took out their laundry allowance, so they got, it was virtually nothing. <laughs> One nurse wrote to her journal and said, I wish I didn't even have to charge. You know, that's how that, that ministering angel thing was part of them. When they came, and also they wanted to leave behind that kind of aura that once upon a time and not so long before Kit, nurses were drunk, disorderly and dishonest. And Florence Nightingale had raised up nursing to be respectable, but they were hanging on to that respectability and they wanted to become a profession. So they wanted to leave behind anything that smacked of, you know, unionism like asking for money. They also worked 65 hours a week. Um, and But when they got back from the war, I found a letter at Melbourne Uni in one of the um, archive boxes there that a breakaway group of nurses had formed a union to ask for more money and better working conditions. And that person had written in the letter, of course, they're all ex-AIF. <laughs> so they come home from the work war and thought, right, they're not treating us like this anymore. Yeah, We've earned it. Thanks. Very much, and I think um, you've, you've earned a cup of tea too. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and your, um, <laughs> thank you. On the life of Dr. Mary de Garris, Geelong's first female obstetrician, was published in 2014 by Australian Scholarly Publishing under the title Woman War Doctor, The Life of Mary de Garris. Um, and, and Bruce's latest research is on the largely unheralded Australian female doctors in the First World War. Today she's going to be speaking on this part of the life of Mary de Garris and her extraordinary work on the Balkan front during the war. Um, and there was a segue, a, a neat segue, provided by Janet to the extent that we're talking now about someone who returned from the war and her expertise was indeed much celebrated and, and welcomed back in Geelong. Yes. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks very much, David. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone, um, for coming along to listen. Very nice indeed. Dr Mary de Garris, the subject of today's talk, was actually raised in Mildura, but she came to Geelong in 1919 to settle after the tumultuous experiences of World War I. And as she stayed for 42 years till her death, I think Geelong can well claim her as one of their own. In 1914, so great was the well, both the British and Australian Army's consternation of having women doctors such as Mary de Garris applying to enlist for the war effort. Though they placed this notice in the Argus, stating their position unequivocally, in line with the British office who had done the same in the Times newspaper. No women doctors. I'll recount experiences of Mary de Garris today as well as interrogate the following three questions. The first is, why were women doctors not permitted to join the Imperial Army's medical corps? And why was so little known about the 24 or around that figure at the moment, Australian women doctors who went to World War I? Why were these untold stories? And then finally the question of whether the Medical Women's War Service had any impacts on Australian society afterwards. Mary de Garris was patriotic. I don't know how she would have voted on the conscription question. Possibly she might have been for it. Certainly her father was very patriotic, a friend of Alfred Deacon's. And she foresaw the crisis in the medical um, services that... Um, occurred in the war, she wrote in 1914, I think that if the war continues, the need for doctors will be so great that women will have a chance of being accepted and given a military status for it. And I much prefer that idea to that of being merely a voluntary helper. Also, I want to be here, which was London, for my man when he comes back. So when war was declared on Germany, patriotic 
women doctors applying to enlist in the armed forces, armed forces was a radical notion because it transgressed traditional ideas of gender. The 19th century notion of women as the gentle sex was an imperial vision expressed, as historian Anne Mitchell argued, in the idea that women as the breeders of the next generation should be protected from the horrors of war. Nurses, however, were the exception. When one questions why this illogical situation was the case, the power dynamics of the gender divide are exposed. With the precedence of Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War, nurses fitted the imperial ideology. They were healers, and crucially, they did not aspire to positions of command. Nurses were trained to be submissive and obedient in the hospital system, which was based on the military model, as Janet McCalman has pointed out. Doctors, in contrast, were independent, autonomous, mostly male professionals, fully in command of their practices, their nursing staff and large hospitals. Female doctors at war, however, were beyond the imperial vision. Leah Lenneman has argued that the Australian and British military command ultimately saw women doctors as a threat to male doctors' power and they feared a disciplinary issue, that male troops would never obey a woman in command. Neither the British or Australian armies would enlist women doctors in World War I until the British finally allowed women to be hired by the um, RMAS AMC, Royal Army Medical Corps, in their Endell Street Hospital in London in 1917, but only after the shortage of available doctors became critical. And they weren't really ever given proper rank or pay. Mary de Garris, coming back to her, here she is, in 1915, she cut her hair short at the outbreak of war. War was a serious business, and we can see she was no longer what I call Edwardian Mary. Um, there are photos in the book. She was now modern. She was born and raised in Mildura, and her mother had signed the Colony of Victoria's Women's Suffrage Petition in 1891. And in her writing, Mary recounted a childhood where there were no distinctions made on the grounds of sex. She was the oldest child, and with her twin sister, they dominated their four siblings, three brothers, younger brothers, and they were Methodists. But the family were reading the latest writings from American Methodist and feminist Frances Willard, who was very pro-lifting um, women's status. So Mary was actually encouraged by her parents in 1900 to enrol in medicine at Melbourne University and was the 31st woman to do so. Graduating in 1905, she obtained her MD in 1907, the second woman in Victoria to do that, after Constance Stone. And she did that while working in the outback in Mataburra, northern Queensland, and then Tipperborough prior to 1914. Now, there's a lot of stories about Mary's experiences because she was a prolific letter writer, more so than a diarist. Um, so when she was away, there's a lot of news, but when she was back in Geelong, the sources were fewer and far between. Mary also travelled the world solo in 1908-09 for 14 months, taking postgraduate courses in London, Edinburgh, Paris, Dublin and New York. And she's absolutely thrilled to attend the, um, fem the suffrage rallies in both London and in America and listening to Emmeline Pankhurst speak. She sent home postcards telling her sister to keep them till she returned, that this was her heroine. By 1914, she was very well qualified and experienced and patriotic and in her mid-30s. So I mentioned before that her father, Elisha de Garris, was very patriotic. Um, he was also, had become a wealthy entrepreneur in the dried fruits industry in Mildura and Melbourne. Friends with many other upper-class um, influential people, federationists, 
They were independent Australian Britons, as was Alfred Deakin, where loyalty um, meant being a pro-empire person. And Mary certainly subscribed to her father's values. While studying medicine at university, her feminist ideas really developed and as she and other women doctors formed the Victorian Medical Women's Students Society, for example, to um, try and gain equal treatment at university for the women students. Mary was also motivated by wanting to equally share the burden of war service with her fiancé, Colin Thompson, who we see here. And she'd become engaged. They'd become engaged just two weeks before um, Britain declared war on Germany. So how did Mary become embroiled with the war on the Balkan front? Because it wasn't where any Australian troops were posted. Um, she had met Colin Thompson while in um, the sole surgeon at the Outback Tipperborough Borough Hospital, and he was the handsome captain of the cricket team. He's there in the top right-hand corner. They had a sheep station there. Colin was needed by his widow mother to run the sheep station, so he um, he took a while to enlist. He had eight, eight other siblings. Finally, he enlisted in 1915, and we don't really know why. And Mary had already applied to enlist, but was rejected. Mary drove alone from Tipperborough to Adelaide to farewell as Colin and her first cousin Ralph, sorry, sailed to Egypt, both on the SS Geelong in 1915. A year later, determined to be near him and terribly anxious, Mary sailed to London and took up work in a hospital there. <coughs> Colin certainly survived Gallipoli and was then posted to the Western Front in France and promoted to sergeant. And this is his last postcard to Mary. Um, I am now platoon sergeant, um, got promoted after Gallipoli, and am present in charge of a platoon, so I'm fairly busy just now. Unfortunately, he was killed at the Battle of Pozieres on the 4th of August 1916. But it took six weeks for Mary to receive notice of his death. And she was terribly, terribly anxious and she took it as a terrible blow because she'd sailed to London to be there in case he were, were ever injured. And her worst fear was realised. Um, it took her quite a while to come to terms with her grief and I'll just read a brief extract that she wrote to her sister about a year later, early in February 1917. I was glad you did not send me Christmas and new greetings and gifts. It makes me sore when people wish me happiness and merriment. There can't be much of either for me, at least till memories fade. I have lost the terrible wearing anxiety about Colin that nearly sent me mad before I left Melbourne. There is no suspense now, but there is a chronic hunger for my dear boy, both mental and physical. It may wear off in time, but it seems worse now than at first. I have to keep my mind and fingers occupied all the time, otherwise I would cry most of the time. I bear it by telling myself it can't be helped, it won't bring him back, one accepts the inevitable, he's all right, everyone dies. Probably he would have been very disappointed in me, though I don't really believe the last... I feel bereft of both husband and child, but at least now I give no hostages to fortune, and if possible in future, I'll not care greatly about anything. So I argue in the book that Mary's grief, um, I guess it didn't radicalise her because she was pro-empire, but now she was determined to take direct action and um, join the Scottish Women's Hospitals, where she could be of much more use, she felt, nearer battlefields in Europe. This is a photo of work actually inside one of the tents of the Scottish Women's Hospitals. 
a lot of these photos from here on, the previous ones were from the Mary de Garris archive. These ones, a lot of them were actually taken by Dr Agnes Bennett, another Australian doctor that Mary worked with in the Scottish Women's Hospitals. They ended up in the Mary de Garris papers, but they're also in the Turnbull Library in Wellington, New Zealand, where Agnes Bennett settled. So the Scottish Women's Hospitals were another challenge to the imperial authorities because Dr Elsie Inglis, in late 1914, had an idea that she wanted to mobilise all the British suffragist societies because those women did not have the vote then and they had a ready network. So she mobilised them to supply the British Army with all female mobile medical units. Unfortunately, the British declined their offer, telling her to go home and sit still. However, the Scottish women's hospitals then offered themselves to the Allied armies of Russia, France, Belgium, Serbia, Greece and Macedonia, who accepted their offers of assistance immediately. Overall, there were 14 Scottish women's hospitals. Royaumont in France was in an abbey. That was the first one established and others were intense, such as the America unit in northern Macedonia. This is the Endell Street Hospital, um, a painting showing um, Flora Murray and Elizabeth Garrett, two foremost British pioneer women doctors. And that hospital became fully staffed by, and run by women. So great was the sort of shortage of medical men <coughs> who, of course, had enlisted and were being wiped out in droves by late 1916. Um, Vera Scanterbury-Brown, who was also an early woman doctor in Victoria, um, she worked here for the duration of the war, and she was 10 years younger than Mary. Anyway, back to the Scottish Women's Hospitals, and there we see them. Again, as we saw those tents on Lemnos, there's huge tents, often with wooden floors. Um, that is Dr Agnes Bennett, very distinctive because she was so tall. Um, she preceded Mary as the surgeon in charge of the America unit at Ostrovo. So the Scottish Women's Hospitals, completely run by women, contributed... Um, to the war effort by raising funds from all over the empire. I was saying before to David, a bit like crowdfunding on the internet today, a lot slower, but it did have brilliant results. Thousands of dollars flowed from America in particular, and the unit was named after that source of money. But your um, wealthy philanthropists, upper class people wanting to help, as the British call them, dear little Serbia, um, during to um, that, the Eastern Front. Now, they, in order to um, be commissioned, the French Red Cross, I think, commissioned them and they had to agree to be run along military lines. So, um, sorry, I'm going to look at another photo here. That was a postcard that was printed at the time that was sent they were very organised with their public relations at headquarters in Edinburgh and um, they regularly had returning staff doing lecture circuits right around um, Britain. Fundraisers came to Australia, they went to India, they Canada, the US. So that's the America unit um, on Lake Ostrovo, which was um, about a day's journey up from Salonika, um, just in northern Greece. De Garris was appointed surgeon um, under the Serbian army on the Balkan front from the 7th, February 1917 to October 1918. And she was initially second in charge to Dr Agnes Bennett, who subsequently settled in New Zealand, but another Australian doctor. The unit had 200 beds in 50 large tents and they treated um, the wounded, the Allied wounded, as well as some of the enemy soldiers. 
There are around 50 staff, aged between 25 and 45 years, and they were surrounded by foreign men's camps, and in the warmer months, they had an enjoyable social life. But conditions were tough, of course. Um, the surgeons conducted operations in all weather, and that included snow, while other staff nursed, drove and maintained ambulances, the sanitary arrangements, and worked as cooks and orderlies. And Miles Franklin um, arrived in, um, I think it was early 1917, and she stayed for six months, working as a voluntary cook and orderly. But she had a very rough time. Um, there were wasps, terrible mosquitoes with bearing malaria, um, terrible winters and very hot summers. As with the army, discipline and curfews were enforced, uniforms were worn and the mail was censored. Most of the staff were paid modestly for their work. Mary earned £200 a year, but that was about half of what she could earn in Australia. I don't think Miles Franklin was paid much at all, so the higher the rank, I think, the better the payment. The Ostrovo Hospital also had a dressing station, which is here, established at De Bravini, which was closer to the battlefields, which were basically raging over the mountains, and the front kept moving down the subsequent battles until the Serbs basically um, won and the war ended in 1918. So the dressing station, and that's where um, Lillian Cooper from Brisbane and um, Mary Bedford, her partner, ran the transport unit and they were based up near the dressing station. So, um, and the dressing station was so that staff could immediately tend to the wounded load them into the Ford ambulances and transport them back down very rugged and rough mountain tracks down to the hospital. The hospital was also situated near a railway line, which was very helpful when um, transporting patients out. In her first month, Mary had a birth by fire when she relieved Dr Lillian Cooper up here. She witnessed, quote, two big air raids on a neighbouring village, and although it was a desolate, windswept place, Mary wrote that the constant air raids added a spice of excitement. So she was known for being fearless. On one memorable occasion, she and nurse, Australian nurses Angel and Saunders were operating in a tent to extract a bullet from the back of a soldier's pallet. They carried on calmly while others scurried into funk holes, particularly the Serbian male attendants. Dr Bennett recorded, only those who know what it is to have bombs falling all around them can realise what an amount of presence of mind and courage such a thing takes. Ostrovo, however, seriously tested Mary's physical resilience and bravery, constantly performing amputations, wound repairs, and they were often multiple wounds, and tending the dying. Personally, she battled dysentery and malaria a number of times. Emotionally, she was in deep mourning for Colin Thompson and sublimating her grief into hard work. In fact, staff would complain that she did too much and it did cause some friction sometimes with the matrons. This is a photo early on, I think, when the unit was first went out in um, early 1916, and that's Dr Elsie Inglis who then, from Scotland, who found the founder, and with Agnes Bennett, riding horses, which they did do at Ostrovo. In September 1917, sorry, I'll just flick through it. I have got a lot of slides here, but these are the ambulances that the women drove and maintained. In fact, Mary Bedford was called Miss Spare Parts <laughs> because she was so good at fixing them. And here's a photo unloading um, <coughs> patients that come probably from the dressing station. But um, this fellow, Sergeant Lukovic, from the Serbian Army, was a f absolutely effusive 
about the care of the Scottish women and the nurses and the I nurses. Thought he, I thought he was thinking for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. And he wrote a wonderful description of Mary in action, how she never rested and she would eat her lunch while she was reading and knitting at the same time. <laughs> but he'd never had the experience of a hospital in his life. They didn't have them in Serbia, so he was absolute. And in fact, there are Serbian memorials, of course, to the Scottish Women's Hospitals um, in the countryside, which I haven't visited yet, unfortunately. But there's a wonderful video, actually, if you look up Scottish Women's Hospitals. Um, the historian, Alan, I've forgotten his other name, but he's made some wonderful... It's virtually a documentary on his website, well worth having a look at. That's just appeared in the last few months, specifically on the SWH. These are um, photos from Mary's album in um, the local inhabitants, the villagers washing in the stream. I'm not sure whether that was a car that was bombed or was it a plane that was crashed, but they did have German aircraft um, going over. In September 1917, Agnes Bennett resigned due to malaria and she had to be repatriated out and appointed Mary as her successor, who was now responsible for the welfare of 250 people. And I often wondered why Mary's diaries were very scant and they were often just to-do lists, unlike her letters, which were quite... Um, effusive and colourful, but very few letters home that I could locate from this time. And it did puzzle me. No photographs, except one that Melbourne Uni had, a very unflattering one. And it puzzled me as to such a huge event in her life. Where were the souvenirs and the mementos? And then I went to um, the Mitchell Library in Glasgow and discovered in the SWH archives, just boxes and boxes of Mary's correspondence when she was running the unit. I, I pictured her sitting in her tent at night with a little typewriter just um, huddled over a little um, stove made out of kerosene tins, which was her innovative idea from the outback. The staff were most impressed by that. But she wrote copious correspondence about all manner of you know, all the personnel matters, the medical supplies, the food, the woman vegetable gardener, was she growing enough food for them? And every, the cemetery, the funerals, I mean, they did it every, everything. As well as the surgeon, the surgical mode. That's Agnes Bennett, that gives you, now she was quite a tall woman. Mary was very short, and we'll get to a photo of Mary soon. As I say, I only found two photos of her in the wall, there she is, with um, one of the Scottish colonels. And they had to liaise with the, the Serbian army continuously too, who were close by. So quite a, a petite woman and her hair changed to white by the age of 38 when she came back, it was completely white. She's there in the um, Scottish Women's Hospital's uniform. It had tartan <coughs> lapels the winter uniform, and here are, I don't know whether these were the women digging the funk holes or were they maintaining the sanitary arrangements, <laughs> I don't know, but they're certainly testing out the gas nuts. Another one from Agnes Bennett's camera. And on sunny days they would wheel the patients out into the sun in the summer, the flies and the wasps weren't too much. And this looks like Agnes Bennett. I could be wrong there. But um, there's stories of Agnes calling all the staff out to just giving them shovels and saying, let's go make the road, which they did, because um, then the French were very impressed and the French army sent helpers to help them. But often the, uh, the person shoving the ambulance down or was called a shover. So again, the women try to jump out and push the ambulances. So, and there's the very proud fleet of ambulances. Mm. 
And there is the, the only photo I found of the America unit under Agnes Bennett and um, Mary Garris and Lillian Cooper. And I think we've got everybody. Miles Franklin, um, Agnes Bennett, Mary next to her. Mary had very old skin, so she didn't have very suntan hair. Now, I suspect that might be Lillian Cooper, but I'm not sure. And I think the other very tall doctor was an English doctor, Dr. Muncaster. But there were no names on the back, so it's rather tricky to work out. But a very rare photo. 1918 proved to be tumultuous on the war front and personally. One freezing night in February after torrential rain, a hurricane hit the camp and I think this had happened before, but this time while Mary was in charge and had virtually demolished it. So precious medical supplies were scattered and broken. A lot of the tents collapsed and patients had to be evacuated on the train. That's where it came in very handy. Working tirelessly, the women had most of the tents re-erected and repaired and the camp almost restored within three days. And Mary wrote a very detailed letter back home to... Um, Embra about that. Then, three months later, her mother died unexpectedly at Guernsey, where her parents, her family had originated from Guernsey, hence the French surname. And Mary was unable to attend the funeral. And of course, for her, this was the second loss of a loved one in two years. So in September 1918, because she never enlisted in the army, she was able to leave. So after serving for 19 months, she resigned from the SWH to return home. And she was definitely worn out and weary. And in fact, Miles Franklin was burnt out after six months. Other doctors lasted a year. I think Agnes Bennett lasted two years. But that was about the term that most of the staff seemed to last because it was very gruelling. And, um, but they were free to leave. So en route she had to go um, to Rome and she contracted Spanish flu in Rome. She called it double pleurisy and I think it was only in hindsight they called it Spanish flu. And in fact her mother seemed to have had that flu and was recovering on Guernsey but died of a sudden heart attack. So it was out there. And it took, she was found um, close to death in a hotel um, by two American medicos who then looked after her, nursed her, and the Scottish Women's Hospital sent a nurse to then take her home back to London. Meanwhile, while she was on, she was sick for six weeks, the armistice was signed and chaos and confusion reigned, it seemed. It took her until February 1919 to reach Melbourne. And in that time, she got, did go back and visit the Scottish Women's Hospitals in Edinburgh to thank them. And they did give her a gold watch. The Scottish Women's Hospital unit at Ostrovo, though, stayed on in Serbia, treating the local people. They moved a bit further south. Another doctor came and on they went, kept working and didn't wind, wind it up till 1921. For her heroic acts, let's see if we can get there. Oh, Christmas party on Christmas Eve, dress up party. They did, you know, I think that intensity of war, when you had moments of peace, you could really, you know, they did, they had parties, they had musical concerts, they had regular visits, dinners, and they were entertained by the other, you know, the French colonels in wherever, and they'd go down to Salonika too. This is the medal that the, the King of Serbia awarded um, most of the Scottish Women's Hospital's doctors. Um, it's the Medal of St Sava Third Class. And then she also received two medals from the British government, um, one of which is there. Um, maybe the experts in medals here... Um, can help me out here. I think that's. I think they were both service medals. They're both there, which I've been told were awarded um, 
to all those from the British government who served. But there were no medals awarded from Australia. And in fact, she's not even in the War Memorial in Canberra. And so, which raises the question, why was she? Some of the Australian doctors were recognised by the Australian government, although unenlisted, but very few, and I'm still working on that. Um, so while medals may seem a trivial thing, the lack of these symbols of heroic service opens up a, a range of factors operating to obscure the Australian women doctors and nurses from view. So here are my reasons, and I guess it seems rather obvious, but the war was far from Australia, and although the war was far from Australia, war correspondents and photographers ensured that the Australian public knew roughly where their loved ones were. But so this focus, I think, obscured other locations, such as the Eastern Front, from Australians. And the work of women doctors, um, and certainly the Scottish women's hospitals, tended to be focused on Serbia and France. And tended to be in areas that Australians really didn't see as the main theatres of war, except for France. And there was a resulting lack of press coverage, certainly not in the UK, but in the Australian press. Um, and that was definitely a factor also, I think, in obscuring um, some of these women nurses and doctors from the Australian's view, who received relatively little news about the Balkan Front and Scottish women's hospitals. And it is in sharp contrast to what the British newspapers did. They, they highlighted Serbia, they adored the Scottish women's hospitals, and some of the doctors, the youngest and prettiest ones, became almost like movie stars, you know, beautiful photos in women's magazines and things. So they definitely became, some of them almost were public celebrities, the Scottish women's hospitals were invited to Buckingham Palace, um, you know, the administrators, in early 1918. It took a while for the royal family to acknowledge it, but they did. Um, so little familiarity for the Australian public. Mary de Garris was in a foreign land, treating foreign soldiers, speaking a foreign language. She spoke Serbian fluently after a few months. She was fluent in French and German as well. Um, as the photo showed, exotic Muslim farm workers in a landscape that de Garris compared to Scotland, not Australia. And perhaps this foreignness was a bit beyond the interest of many Australians because they were understandably preoccupied with what the Australian men were doing. Um, the extraordinary losses, as we know, and the post-war burden of grief which is being examined and is being examined by Bart Zeno and many other historians. Um, we know about this. People were in deep shock for decades afterwards. And post-war society was preoccupied with the loss of almost a third of the generation of young men. So not wanting to remember the war, I think, also contributed to people not knowing about the women doctors and all of those nurses. Only 24 or so in number, the Australian women doctors were a minority who mostly returned home. I think invariably all of them did. Uh, again, the jury's still out on that. And when compared with the colossal losses of men and the wounded, that overrode all other considerations. The Australian medical profession could have valorised the women's efforts more, but I found very little evidence of this in the BMA journals. From 1914 to 1920, I located only one article about the work of the SWH written in 1917. So I think the case of Mary de Garris and the other women doctors at the war front shows how deeply entrenched and universally determining were the ideas of gender in the profession. After the war, the Gallipoli myths, of course, became hegemonic, as we all know. Um, the imperial discourse about warriors, sacrifice, nationalism, commemoration, 
um, has long shaped Australians' perceptions. But I think the other side of this was the failure to recognise efforts of others, such as the Australian women doctors and nurses who served overseas. And I thought, well, would things have been different if the women were at Gallipoli? But of course, the nurses' experience shows us um, probably not. The nurses received very little recognition after the war, um, which I think clearly reveals the tenacity of imperial gender hierarchies. It seems ultimately that being male was definitely um, a key to being remembered and commemorated in Australia after World War I. And because the women doctors weren't enlisted, we've seen they did have advantages, they were free to leave, but it also meant they didn't officially exist, um, both in the war and in the future for the Australian government, which meant no pensions from the Department of Veteran Affairs, um, no war decorations, public memorials, etc. And even, and I can understand this, and hopefully I'll rectify it, but the Geelong Hospital's honour board it doesn't list Mary de Garris because she was she didn't leave from Geelong. She settled there afterwards. So I'll have a little talk to them about that. <laughs> Mary de Garris was also a quiet achiever, as were many of the early women doctors. And so there aren't a lot of records left. We're very lucky to have such an extensive archive with her because subsequently families just tended to, as they do, clear up and throw out that old stuff. So um, I don't know how many people knew the details of her war service because after the war she chose to settle in a new city in Geelong. I know she did speak to schoolgirls about her war experiences in the early 20s. Um, so I guess I would be saying um, there is one more related question and that's the question of, did their work make any difference to Australian society post-war? Um, it's good and bad news. In Australia and Britain, um, understandably, as I've said, the preoccupation was with the returned soldiers and governments gave them preference, governments and employers. Um, returned soldiers were given preference for university places and for jobs. And it seems the returned women doctors slipped quietly into carving out their own arenas in the medical profession. And this was because they did experience discrimination as the male-dominated profession reasserted itself. The number of women enrolments at the University of Melbourne declined sharply in the 1920s. Women doctors also had difficulty accessing consultancy positions at the Royal Melbourne and the Children's Hospitals, for example, in the 1920s, Kate Campbell and others gave up trying to get in consultancies. And that did affect their medical careers. Heather Shirt, my colleague at Melbourne Uni, is doing a lot of work in this area. In Britain, women were finally given the vote in 1920. So some historians have argued, well, that was a definite reward for their work war service, but other historians such as Leah Lenneman and Getty argue that this wasn't connected to women gaining the franchise. In fact, they're pretty adamant that nothing changed particularly, except that one change that occurred that Getty points out was that women could now treat male patients in hospitals, which they were prohibited from doing previously, prior to the war. So it seems the experience gained in World War I for medical women didn't produce any professional benefits for the women in society generally. In fact, I guess we'd argue the reverse occurred and discrimination accelerated in the 20s. However, on a personal level, gaining surgical and bacteriological experience was invaluable for the women, and I think that was a strong motivation. They were basically excluded from surgeon positions, except for Lillian Cooper, who was Australia's first woman surgeon in Brisbane. Um, so that experience was invaluable. And then there were the doctors like Vera Scantlebury, who 
had the opportunity of working with the other top pioneering British women surgeons, such as Flora Murray and Elizabeth Garrett at the Endell Street Hospital in London. And then there was the opportunity of managing large organisations, the Endell Street Hospital, the Scottish Women's Hospital, and that was something that women had never been offered before. The Scottish Women's Hospitals collectively treated around 26,000 patients and employed over 180 women doctors in the war. Mary de Garris, Agnes Bennett, Lillian Cooper and another Adelaide doctor, Laura Fowler Hope, all working for the SWH, all witnessed women in charge and saw what women could do given the opportunities. And this was invaluable knowledge and skills that I think definitely translated into increased confidence, authority, assertiveness and independence for those women after the war. They had the knowledge of how bureaucracies worked, of how power networks operated. They knew the value of working collectively, of networking, and they mentored the younger women medical students coming through for decades through their own organisations. They saw the future and inspired many women who followed them to never give up on pursuing women's rights in the medical profession. As Mary de Garris wrote, I shall always remember my association with the Scottish Women's Hospitals with pleasure. Practical experience has convinced me that women run things very well, making me a more ardent feminist than ever. And of course, Mary went on in Geelong and was very influential in the design of the new hospital um, in the 1920s that they built, um, the Kitchener Memorial, which had separate pavilions to treat infectious diseases, so you had your TB wing not near the convalescent wing, etc. Um, she got the first maternity ward into the public hospital, the first antenatal and postnatal clinics, and had an exemplary record in, um, in the maternity ward for the first 10 years where she worked until middle age and then became a consultant. But along the way, she did take on the dental profession. She was possibly the first person to research causes of pain in labour and take um, childbirth as an area of study and in need of a, a lot of research. She pioneered a database, and that still exists about this long, a chart, where she charted 2,000 labours and had collected all this data. She published 48 medical articles in the medical journals, at least three books. And yes, she was a force to be reckoned with. She didn't take fools lightly, and I can now see um, she even had a dispute with an infant welfare nurse who didn't... Um, she felt the nurse had undermined her publicly in front of a patient. And when I think and read about all of this prior experience, I can see she was probably still operating under a military model, as hospitals were, probably up until the 50s. So, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Ruth. Really fascinating um, Thanks, on, on, on several levels. As you so rightly pointed out, um, from an Australian vantage point, we never hear any tales about either Scottish women's mm. hospitals or the front in and around Serbia. Um, yes. But also the life of Mary herself, um, mm. an extraordinary life. You really gave us an insight into someone who is incredibly driven, um, mm. partly from grief, of course, but also partly from other motives, including yes. the belief in the capabilities of women doctors mm. and managerial skills and, and also those of her colleagues too, um, which, yes. which, which emerge very strongly. And yes. we also get a sense of why you're so interested in your ongoing work seems to be in this legacy. So, I think I'm fascinated by this level of self-confidence that these pioneering people, women, had at a time when possibly you wouldn't expect that. I guess we didn't really hear it. We had models when mm. we were growing up <laughs> of headmistresses and the occasional matron, but I don't think I 
well, there, I guess there was a dearth of really strong yeah. role models, really, when I was growing up. So I do find that fascinating. And also the, the courage of um, the nurses and the doctors doing the work they were doing. It's Both the um, importance of that kind of work and your enthusiasm for it shines very brightly. We have some time for some questions, please. Just yes. a comment, really. Um, the 19th century, the Scots were before the early ones of the medicine. Mm. Anyway, it was just mm. interesting that it was the Scottish women's hospital rather than the British women's hospital, for example, the Scots. Yes. I mean, I can remember even as a kid, lots of doctors from the country towns in Victoria, the day of Edinburgh, to do a surgery, for example. Yes. And the Scots were not trying to lead the way in medicine. And, and I guess that's just another example how far forward they were from one of those countries. Yes, in fact, Agnes Bennett... Including that model, South Scotland. Right. Agnes Bennett did study at Edinburgh to get qualified um, in medicine. And Mary was very proud. She was part Scottish through her mother's line. She was always very proud of being Scottish. But I hadn't thought of that. That's a really great point. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you read it? Um, Mandy, Janet can also um, comment on this. Uh, how, how, what would you say about the way in which um, women have been remembered in the centenary celebrations? Your observations over the last 12 months or so? You mentioned. Well, you know, it has been an opportunity for untold stories to be told, thank goodness. Um, I don't think I can comment really right across the board. Um, there's been some encouraging things, but, um, yeah, I think we need to keep working and publishing um, to get more of those stories out there. So because the stories aren't immediately apparent, there has been more attention than previously on the nurses. But what do you think, Janet? Mm -hmm. well, it's been amazing the nurses. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, you are for this and this is about the antipostal that you're talking about. There are, there are other areas. Um, mm -hmm. not, every, not every soldier went to the front, not everybody who went to the front was a man. So mm -hmm. all of these stories become out of the of things. I think this was one of the other dangerous stories of the women on the front front. You would also be taking um, up um, jobs that they would never thought they would. Yes, they were, you know, they were running farms, um, and they had also the just the stick they had after the war. Yes. Um, they lost that, that um, outlet that they do mm. those jobs, but the fact that it happened stayed in some way. Mm. You know, it, so that was the beginning of something that was a huge revolution after the war. But yes. the, the doctors had almost nothing, and, and it does, I just remember that the, the nurses, Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of questions. One is, you said that you had a very olive skin. Do you know if you had any Aboriginal ancestry? That's the first one. And in relation to women chewing leadership positions during World War One. Wasn't there a trend towards that in Australia, and especially in the outback areas because of the shortage of labour? That often you would find women in Australia, if their husbands were away driving or shearing, that um, you know, a long time before the war ever happened, that, that they would be taking responsibilities for the farm and what had to be done and so forth. Yes. Um, that's why I discovered Mary de Garris took her first full-time position in Mataburra, which is inland from Longreach, took a week on a boat to sail up there and then a couple of days by coach to get to Mataburra. And she was the sole surgeon, but she was taking on that position because the previous woman, also a Melbourne Uni medical graduate, had passed it on to her. And then Mary stayed for her 14 months and then passed it on to another graduate, female graduate. That's the extent they went to get their experience, and yes, they were sole surgeons in these little outback hospitals. I had no idea that they were doing that. 
Um, sorry, I might be getting off the track. Um, what was... Aboriginal Act? Do you oh, know if you had Aboriginal Act? Um, well, I doubt it be, only because she's recorded her family history very well. The certificates of birth, deaths and marriages are all there. Um, her mother was Scottish and her father was from Guernsey and both of the families emigrated in around 1852. They were Wesley Methodists and whether they felt persecuted, I'm not sure, but or whether it was the gold rush or what, I don't know. Um, and so they were the next generation that she was descended from. So can't see that there are, is any Aboriginal ancestry there. Because Mary was born in 1881. Yeah. The, the only thing I know about the Salonica Front was there was an enormous death rate from disease there. Uh -huh. so, were there many women who, who died of disease um, serving, whether it was the, doing the things like Mars um, Franklin or the... Yes, um, there were... I just were, remember reading horrific figures about how many of the troops had died from disease. Right. Um, look, I don't know about the nurses. I haven't looked, but certainly I know in the America unit there were three deaths of staff members. Now, there could have been more. Um, Mary Agnes Bennett, under her time, I think there was one, when Mary was there, a nurse got um, an appendix burst and became gangrenous, gangrenous before Mary could save her, basically. And there was another person who died in the Scottish Women's. Suggest they were very, very um, good at what they I were don't doing know. because that sounds like a very low death rate for a... Yes, but people home. were sent home ill. Right. Definitely, with malaria. Um, she, Mary was incredibly strict with sanitation and filling in the swamp and trying to... They did have quinine, but they didn't... I couldn't find any records of raging infections going through the place, but I think she did say she had dysentery, so I think that was a problem at times. Um, and certainly malaria was. So I suspect there were po possibly some deaths from malaria, but I don't know about the rest of Salonica. Mm. That was over the mountains from where they were. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Greg. When thinking about how, you know, on one hand it's very difficult for these women to get recognition in their own mm. lifetime, but I'm wondering if you can comment on how difficult it is for the historian to then write their, their story. And it seems to me that the side plays the reference as you had to the kind of research that you do with this. Dragging this person up from the past is actually a really hard thing to do. Maybe Janet can comment on that as well. But what's, mm -hmm. what's it like to do research to tell that story? Well, look, I just found it fascinating. I mean, tedious at times, but to discover an archive of possibly 12 boxes of material that no one else had really done any substantial work on. And it was actually getting that together. And part during the research process, the, the great nieces were wondering what to do with the archive. And they asked me to go and visit the State Library and see if they were interested. And the State Library of Victoria are going to take it so you, when they're finished with it. So that, that, that collection was private hands. Yes, it? yes, it's in private hands. Mm -hmm. So um, they're really pleased about that. I'm very pleased about that. I think the State Library is pretty pleased. Don't know where they're going to fit it, but <laughs> I did convince them that there are so few comprehensive archives about <laughs> early women doctors as this. Plus there's numbers of stories with her siblings about you know white, early white settlement in Australia and how families basically made the nation. I mean, entrepreneurs and all sorts of pioneer aviators and all sorts of people in the Tagaris family. It's, it was very fascinating. But I did have to think laterally too. And, of course, the internet's made it. So there's so much more and a lot more coming out with the centenary celebrations of World War One. Um, 
So looking at different collections, I mean, isn't that what you do, Bart? Well, <laughs> I don't I, think there's any harm. I the cream off the top. I don't think it did strike you listening to both of you that I've been forced to read these archives really yes. closely in detail. Yes. Right? And produced a couple of books very well based on that. Mm. And I, I'm trying to think about, mm. I mean, there's hundreds of books written about men from the First World War from Australia. Mm. But I can't think of one since the biography of John Monash that actually has, has given them that same right. treatment. Right, the I'm wondering yes. if there's two yeah. women who have you know, not had a great bit of recognition have actually produced better histories oh. than God. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> That's very interesting. You said there was a, a gap mm. of letters here that you mm. found quite a large pile in Scotland. Yes. The so, Scottish is, Women's Archives. That's right. Why, why were all those um, letters, because you mentioned that, that they were typewritten, mm. how did they get to be there rather than um, the destinations oh, in Australia? Well, they were writing to these well, when Mary was the chief medical officer, so she'd have to report back oh, to okay. Edinburgh headquarters. Gotcha. They would have to answer her requests for all right. manner of things. So I think uh, when the war finished, everybody packed up, took all their correspondence back to Edinburgh. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and that's how the archive is still there. Well, in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was it so much a personal yeah. Sorry? Was it so much a personal archive? It was her time. Yes. She was so busy. She had much of a personal archive. Oh. I think I can get out of here. <laughs> Just a really specific question, Ruth. Yes. You, you mentioned that letters were censored. Who censored them? Good question. Um, I was trying to what, imagine who was doing the censoring. Oh, I imagine the CMO, perhaps. Okay. The army had the, the, been complete. The, the, which army? That was that was my, my question. Mm. Yeah, the Serbians wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Because they would, well, okay. the ones who were English-speaking could, but... That's all right. That's my... My, no. own, my own mind was just puzzling. It's all right. No, I'll well, have to... Think more about that one. So it so would have been... They some, would have found their way... It would have been some British... And the pencil process system that goes through. Yeah. It so, uh, would have been some system of censorship from the front. Yeah, they would have found They just wouldn't have wanted to know this many casualties, you know. Yeah. That sort of yes. So letters would take a heck of a long time to firstly mm. be uh, delivered by sea and then also all of that to be scanned and. and uh, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I'll have to look further into it. Mm. But, um, sorry, one last question. Yep. Just very quickly, the mm. Serbian that she was presented is pretty much in the middle compared to your book. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they are obviously very, very recognised for the work they did, but mm. Serbians more yes. so than anybody else. Mm. Mm. Just looking at that level, it's yes. pretty yes. interesting. Mm. 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 Um, Melbourne Uni's Medical History Museum had um, doctors and dentists at World War One an exhibition earlier or late last year and they um, had that all restored the medals being Does that be heavy enamel on copper or yes, something? Yes, enamel and silver I think So that was good that's been restored but Mary's gravestone apparently is in very bad shape so that's the next project. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a fine note on which to end up. You yeah, obviously know? made a mark in Geelong, though, because there is the Garris House. Yes, yes. The, well, and plus now Geelong Private, which obviously used to be Geelong yes. And we only had a, yes. a, a small glimpse at her claims to fame in obstetrics and, and other things, really, yes. in terms of Ruth's yes. talk, too. Mm -hmm. but, but I'll ask you to join with me in thanking Ruth again for a fantastic <laughs>